Okay, I think we can get started. If my click, if my clocks are, are synced to yours, I think we can get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, uh, to the Planning Futures Conference organized by Hiba Buakar, um, streaming from all these places in the world to your living rooms. Um, we are um, in the third panel of the day, um, uh, rethinking planning from the margins and. Um, just been an inspiring, powerful conversation thus far, really looking forward to seeing how um, the conversation continues uh, to expand and um, so on. So my name is Delia Wendell. I'm an assistant professor uh, at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and I, it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. Um, I will be uh, brief, but but uh, quickly introduce our illustrious interlocutors uh, in this third panel. And I will begin with Teresa Caldera, who is an anthropologist and um, professor of urban planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, many of you no doubt know um, Professor Caldera's groundbreaking book, City of Walls, um, which looked at forms of segregation shaping the urban rich and poor on the peripheries and fortified enclaves um, of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Professor Caldera's current research uh, projects are focused on new forms of urban citizenship and collective life across four cities in the global south, uh, rights claims in the context of peripheral urbanization, and how artistic expression bears on our conceptualization of democratic public space. Welcome, Teresa. Um, we will next hear from Akira Drake Rodriguez, um, who is an assistant professor of city and regional planning at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Rodriguez's work and research examines the ways that disenfranchised groups make claims on urban spaces to access and sustain forms of political power. Her framing of urban planning politics in this way is critical, I think. It highlights uh, the continued marginalization of minority groups through urban policies that defund affordable housing and public institutions, while it at the same time supports militarized police forces. Her book, Diverging Space for Deviants, is a study on the politics of public housing in Atlanta and is forthcoming, I think, in just a few months. Um, our next speaker will be James Wynn H. Spencer, um, who is Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School, as well as Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at Louisiana State University. Professor Spencer's current research focuses on international urbanization and planning with a particular focus on water supply, infrastructure and inequality, and infectious disease. Much of his research and planning practice has been focused in Southeast Asia, and his 2014 book, Global Urbanization, tracks the everyday experiences and transnational dependencies of globalization in a comparative study across global North and South cities. And last, but certainly not least, we will hear from Libby Porter, who is a professor of sustainability and urban planning and vice chancellor's principal research fellow at RMIT University in Melbourne. Professor Porter leads research on the politics of urban land, marginalized property rights and dispossession, critical urban governance and decolonizing urban planning. Of her many generative areas of research, her work related to unlearning the colonial cultures of planning from an indigenous rights and history perspective is critical, I think, to the, a conference such as this that helps to locate conversations coming from that perspective. Professor Porter's most recent work in that regard is the co-authored book, Planning in Indigenous Australia from Imperial Foundations to Postcolonial Futures. Thank you all for being here and sharing your reflections on planning from the margins. Um, to everyone joining in, um, do add your questions to the chat and I'll do my best to facilitate the Q&A that comes after, but we will hear from the, the speakers in that order. And um, my last task before I hand over the virtual floor will be to kind of center a little bit some of the questions driving discussion in this panel. So our collective task 
um, our collective task um, is to rethink planning from the margins. Conceiving of the quote unquote margins as both places and also positions of power, exclusion and neglect. How might we reconceptualize planning practice from the margins, from those related experiences and knowledge? What new theorizations could thinking from and planning with the margins bring to light? So with that, I will hand over to Teresa Caldera. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction, Delia. And I cannot not thank um, Hiba for organizing this absolutely fantastic conference to bring us all together <clears throat> here and to create in this space for so many provocative questions and conversations. So Hiba, you rocked. This is fantastic. So <laughs> congratulations and thank you very much for having included me in this um, <clears throat> in this conversation. So. Um, what I want to do today is, um, as I reflect on the questions that Delia has just read, so um, I, and, and one of the main was how new views of the center or the mainstream emerge <clears throat> when we foreground productively marginalized perspectives or how can um, we reconsider margins. I thought that I do, I certainly agree that to take the perspective of powerless people um, in, into consideration and to, um, and to think from neglected sides are things that can disrupt dominant formulations. I'd like to unsettle the notion of margins as a position from where to formulate planning and political projects. And I propose instead that we think in terms of transversality. This means um, not only to challenge mainstream epistemologies, but also to think without dualisms and binaries, such as margin center or margin mainstream, and to think from unstable and negotiated positions rather than from fixed ones. <clears throat> As I will argue, the notion of transversality is more apt for the understanding of the complexity of social process, especially in the urban South, and more importantly, for the construction of objects of analysis that may reveal emergent and novel processes. Transversality may also allow new forms of criticism and, to, and thus become a more powerful tool for political articulation, for remaking planning and imagining alternative futures. I should start by saying that the ideas that I will present here have been developed in conversation with three colleagues, Gautam Ban, Kelly Gillespie, and Abdul Malik Simon. During the last several years, and especially since the beginning of the pandemic, we have worked together to analyze data we have produced individually in the cities where we work, Sao Paulo, Delhi, Johannesburg, and Jakarta. We have been developed concepts and perspectives to think of those cities one in relation to the other and simultaneously experimenting with forms of authorship that are collective. As I will explain in a bit, one of the dimensions of transversality that interests us refers to the type of intellectual work that we're trying to create. Thus, when I say we today, I'm referring to the four of us and our collective work. In this brief talk, I want to discuss two possible ways to engage uh, with the notion of transversality. On the one hand, it can be considered as a feature of modes of urbanization that are common in the global south. And on the other hand, it can be taken as a methodological tool, as a way of constituting objects of analysis that cut across different fields, process, cities. From both perspectives, to think in terms of transversality can offer, offer insights for politics and for planning practices. Let me start with the first perspective. I began to use the notion of transversality a few years ago when writing about the process of peripheral urbanization. 
This means a way of producing the urban that is quite pervasive in the global south and, we, and in which residents themselves largely construct their cities. I argue that peripherbanization does not necessarily entail the growth of cities towards the hinterlands. It does not simply refer to a spatial location in the city, its margins, but rather to a way of producing a space that can be anywhere. I argue that one of the characteristics of this mode of production of space is that it engages transversely with official logics. The other characteristic of this peripheral urbanization is that first it operates with a certain temporality and agency. The residents are agents of urbanization and this is a long-term process. It also generates new modes of politics and creates highly unequal and heterogeneous cities. There are two points in these characterizations that are important for our discussion today. First, although I continue to use the terms peripheries and peripheral, the focus of the analysis on the process of production of space, not on fixing it to a certain location. Peripheries are not fixed in two ways. On the one hand, these spaces are constantly being transformed and improved, and one day they cease to be peripheral. And on the other hand, the process of peripherization is constantly being displaced. It moves around in the city as some areas improve and become legalized and cease to be peripheral, while others more precarious become available for new developments. The fact that one area is regularized does not mean that the one adjacent to it will be, creating thus geographies of remarkable heterogeneity and inequality. Additional, additionally, a crucial characteristic of this process is that residents are full citizens, agents of the construction and urbanization of their space and articulators of their own politics. Thus, to think in terms of peripheral urbanization is to set aside views of the city in terms of both the spatial margins and social marginality. This has important consequences for considerations of how they can be engaged in planning processes. And the second point that I want to emphasize is the following. When I, when I argue that periphery is engaged transversely with official logic, I call attention to the fact that peripheries are a space that frequently unsettle official logics. For example, those of the legal property, formal labor, state regulation, and market capitalism. Nevertheless, they do not contest these logics directly as much as they operate with them in transversal ways. That is, by engaging the many problems of legalization, regulation, occupation, planning, and speculation, they redefine those logics and in so doing generate urbanizations of heterogeneous types and remarkable political consequences. Cities that have undergone political urbanization are usually marked by significant spatial and social inequality. Nevertheless, because of this transversal engagements, inequalities cannot always be mapped out in simple and dualistic oppositions such as regulated versus unregulated, legal residence versus Islam, formal versus informal. Rather, these cities exhibit multiple formations of inequality wherein categories such as formal and regulated are always shifting and unstable. Thus, one needs to set aside the notion of informality and the dualistic reason it usually implies in thinking terms of transversal logics to understand these complex urban formations which are inherently unstable and contingent. To emphasize transversality means to realize that peripheries are improvised, improvised by necessarily chaotic or unplanned, but not necessarily chaotic and unplanned. Residents produce the space themselves, but the state is not absent. It regulates, legislates, writes plans, provides infrastructure, polices, and upgrades spaces. Quite frequently though, the state acts after the fact to modify spaces that are already built and inhabited. 
the conditions of irregularity and illegality regarding land in peripheral areas are numerous and vary widely. Moreover, they change over time as residents engage in different politics and relationships with the state. Residents bet on the possibility of legalization and regularization and most frequently either succeed in seeing it happen or live with the consequence of ongoing irregularity. Thus, there is a temporality related to legalization and regularization as well. The state is co-producer of this process of transformation and of peripheral urbanization. In sum, the attention to transversality allows to characterize a process that defies both the fixity of locations and the rigidity of classifications. To think in terms of transversality is to avoid arguments that usually come in binaries and that imply that what pertains to one side could be clearly separated from what belongs to the other side, the formal versus the informal, for example. This, for, this process of production of space operates simultaneously, inherently, and transversally with irregularity and regularity, legality and illegality, formality and informality. Moreover, all these conditions are constantly being transformed and the state and its several branches are cru crucial in these transformations. But to think in terms of transversality is also to open new ways of understanding the planning process in these areas. Planning intervenes in process of urbanization not by trying to foresee and frame the future, but rather by acting after the fact, as I said. Planning in cities that are in large part produced by our construction must operate with the realization that will not create the framework for the production of space in the future, but rather will try to fix, repair, regulate, rearrange urban areas that were produced in spite of it, following other types of blueprints. Planning thus comes to regularize, legalize, give amnesty to illegal occupations, manned, bring infrastructure to already built areas. As it does this, it must operate with the residents, builders, citizens. It must engage them in the planning process. This opens the spaces for coalitions, intersectional configurations, the struggles, and the articulation of a counter practice. Planning must be modest in its ambitions and careful in its interventions. It must work with what exists instead of against what encounters. It should not operate in the mode of erasure and assuming a tabula rasa as is the norm in modernist planning. It should learn other practices. But let me turn now to the other way of conceiving uh, transversality that my colleagues and I are both developing and trying to use. Here, transversality is a tool of analysis, a method that we engage with, with the intention of producing new forms of knowledge and of practice. Our interest is putting Sao Paulo, Delhi, Jakarta, and Johannesburg into conversation, comes from various directions, but two are important to mention. First, our understanding that there are familiar processes unfolding in the four of them, in the four cities, but in quite different ways. Second, our conviction that tropes usually evoked in the analysis of these cities, such as violence, density, failed infrastructure, etc., in addition to being usually dystopian, do not take as much far either to reveal new and emerging urban process or to produce new types of analysis. The familiar process detected in four cities that we study include democratization, its instabilities and its reversals, it includes the transformation in modes of collective life that a generation of young urbanites born in the city are creating as they affirm they belong to the whole city rather than only to a specific location, it includes the way in which young women are reshaping their femininity. But the focus on familiarities could not take us too far. Whatever was similar, like democracy, was also deeply different. We have always been interested in the difference, but their exploration frequently leads into modes of knowledge production that we found problematic. 
One of them is the traditions of area studies in their consolidated modes of conceiving of what makes a Latin American city or a South Asian city or an African city and so on. Even if we go beyond area studies, located modes of thinking proliferate with their tendency to emphasize enclosed units, either Johannesburg or Africa, for example, but also either the margin or the center, the slum or the formal city and so on. In this mode of thinking, the tendency is always to emphasize what sets poles apart, what makes each side distinctive, what makes the margin different from the center, what makes Sao Paulo different from Johannesburg. In anthropology, this is a deeply root mode of imagining objects of analysis that can be traced back to cultural relativism in the assumption created to undermine evolutionism that each social cultural formation is a kind of totality and must be analyzed in its own terms if you want to avoid the scenes of ethnocentrism or racism for that matter. But even if we think according to other registers, we're more often than not direct to set things apart. The modern social fact that anchors theories in the social science is always imagined as a distinct fact purged of its representational ambiguities as Mary Poole so brilliantly argues. In reality, at the core of the social science or of efforts of thinking in general as structuralism would argue, there is classification, ordering. And to classify, as Mary Douglas demonstrates, is to taboo the ambiguous spaces between categories. With the notion of transversals, we are interested in both getting ourselves immersed in and going beyond the impurity of these spaces in between. We are interested in drawing lines across what has been kept apart. Since Kelly, Gott, and Malik and I started to work together, it was clear to us that we would like to bring Sao Paulo, Delhi, Jakarta, and Johannesburg into conversation in ways that both maintain and disrupt these specificities. A straight comparison was out of the question as it would tend to protect these specificities. Juxtaposition, which I had used before in the analysis of peripheral urbanization, was a possibility we considered. The cases were dissimilar and we would orchestrate their juxtaposition in a way that they, would, they could illuminate each other, force attention to different aspects to, of each other. With time, we came to understand, uh, both the, to understand that both comparison and juxtaposition, or we came to understand both comparison and juxtaposition as modes of an adjacency, as ways of keeping things alongside of it, to each other. It seemed to us that although several processes might be illuminated in this way, like the process of auto construction and peripheral urbanization, it was still not the best we could do while trying to work through these different archives. Up to that point, we we're thinking of each of us altering separate pieces and combining them in a volume, each one talking about the city she was studying. Transversality comes to us as a possibility, as a space of experimentation, an alternative. Transversals are things that are situated across, neither here nor there. In a recent panel in which we present our work, Kelly Gillespie defined transversals as lines drawn to cross other lines. To operate transversally means to select a few empirical entry points that allow us to talk about the urban and its transformation in new ways. They are the perspectives from which to think ethnographically about collective life in the cities. To operate transversally is to put particularities into conversation with each other. The way you operate is to select an empirical entry point from one city and give each other enough ethnographical information about the four cities so that it can absorb it and think of each of our cases collectively and with the, and with the terms of the others. Uh, we write together, write and rewrite, disregarding who is writing about which city, accepting our different styles and theoretical choices. And we altered the resulting analysis collectively as we did recently in an uh, article about the pandemic. Um, as we work transversely- Sorry, uh, sorry. sorry to interrupt, Teresa, but we're over time. I'm wondering if um, 
if we might be able to wrap up a little bit. Okay, so I will My skip apologies. a paragraph. Thank you. Um, so let me just say this. Um, as we work transversely, we do not aim at arriving at general conclusions and models. We're not especially interested in a model of Southern urbanism, for example, a model that fits all. We always talk about urbanism in the plural. We're interested in describing particularities and their processes in cities. Transversality is a process that takes us away from area studies, from cultural relativism, from classifications, from binaries, from localized thinking, from carefully defining and guarding identities, from comparison, from juxtaposition. Transversality is a mode of operation of paying attention that requires that we start with new names, new definitions, new objects, which will have to remain fluid, unlocated, woven across what are, were originally different archives that we put into conversation with each other. We think of transversality as a method that can generate alternative epistemology that may anchor planning practice capable of unsettling formations of power and entrenched inequalities. Thank you and sorry for going beyond the time. That was excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for your provocations. Um, allow me to turn over the floor now to Professor Akira Rodriguez. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon to everyone. And I'm, I'm really excited to be in conversation with this group um, on these topics in this moment. Um, I join others in thanking the organizers, uh, Hiba and Lila amongst them in bringing together uh, such a wonderful event um, throughout this day. I'm looking forward to the next panel as well. Um, this afternoon, um, it's quite funny because I kind of feel like I can just say like same a little bit to Teresa's <laughs> presentation because it feels like a lot of the issues that um, I have questions for were um, really answered through a lot of the um, theorizing that you just provided. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. Um, so I, I sort of offer these provocations um, that have emerged in my work of studying uh, marginalized communities and marginalized spaces within urban planning. Um, I thought about this for a while and um, really couldn't figure out um, very similarly these sort of um, takeaways or best practices or lessons learned in any way that I felt like would be really productive. And so I kind of wanted to flip it a bit and offer out these tensions um, that have emerged. Um, I start here uh, with a map. Uh, this is a map of public housing um, that once existed in, a, in the city of Atlanta. Um, and I think about how um, this map of communities um, is uh, essentially, one could consider it a map of the margins, uh, even though it's just downtown Atlanta. Um, these developments replace the Work Progress Administration's designation of slums, um, and yet they remain pretty adjacent to these very productive circuits of capital in the downtown area. Um, so while they were marginalized again within the downtown, they were still relatively privileged to those whose homes they replaced. Um, those who were excluded admission into these developments and those who would come in the later years of the program. These early residents assimilated with greater ease, um, would um, have an expanding private housing market available to them, were afforded an undue amount of federal, state, and local support, public, private, philanthropic, economic, and political, and benefited from better quality housing relative, again, to those who lived in public housing at the end of the last century. Of course, to be marginalized is always relative, but I wonder if in constructing histories of marginality, if the narrative must always focus on the incorporation of their interest into the mainstream. In uh, my recent work, I find that these in, um, tensions exist in my intent and practice. Those who are marginalized um, in the case of Philadelphia Public Schools, the actual site of the school, the institution of public schools, um, the teacher and the urban student uh, want to have their perspectives centered, their voices heard and their priorities on the agenda. 
In working to co-produce that work, the expert is forced into the middle, if not the front, to provide legitimacy. In the discursive material practices of planning, the co-production of marginal plans are iterated through the language of plan speak. Experiences are collated, graphed, and mapped. Outliers dismissed and community reconstructed. If the expert is decentered, then eventually the field and the plan returns to the fore. The result is this plan, which requires a bounding of place and time, inherently creating new margins. So we begin to worry about the role of the plan in stretching out the protest or the political rage, as Mustafa said earlier, into angle benchmarks, limited focus areas, and ever competing visions. From there is another tension I reached early on in my work in Atlanta, uh, this issue of representation as the endpoint of the marginal narrative. It appears throughout public housing history, uh, there's always tokenism, these identity politics, and descriptive representation as shown here. By the end of the public housing program in Atlanta, for example, public housing demolition um, is positioned by, as common sense by four Black women leaders the head of the housing authority, the chief of police, the superintendent of public schools, and the, and the mayor. <clears throat> These women worked alongside and against Black women, head of households who range from the very young to a recently and still empowered senior tenancy. Striving together to articulate a coherent narrative of marginalization, these women offered up the decayed environment of public housing as the sole determinant of their social positioning. Hope Six, New Urbanism, and other markers of smart growth shaped a return to environmental determinism and the central role of the planner, who was now also a developer and later site manager and social service provider. Through establishing a coherent narrative of marginalization rooted in environmental determinism that was co-constructed through the legitimate planner developer, the descriptive representation of marginalized residents ended up being just a mirror of the status quo. Outside of these framing and method uh, methodological issues of marginalization and its study, I find my empirical work is challenged by these tensions as well. I find them in public safety and the abolitionist futures in my work in public housing and public schools was also fairly central to some of the protests over the summer in the US. This tension in marginal spaces comes from being wholly devoid of public infrastructure, including state produced public safety, from police officers to streetlights to surveillance cameras. This literally creates opportunities for harm while also precluding the conditions for communities to collectively act towards measures of repair, accountability, and self-determination. There is also a massive amount of state violence that materializes in the margins as interpersonal violence, deindustrialization as a precursor to intimate harm, the violence of the state that marginalizes the personhood of Black women and its complicity in sexual assault rates. But calls for safety from the margins are often answered by the state-produced public safety. So Black women call for greater safety, which brings them into direct conflict with their family members and themselves, who are targets of that excessive policing and surveillance. Young students call for police free schools, yet without local support, these calls are subsumed into movements to reform and defund. Again, filtered through the lens of the planning expert. Many of the other speakers on the previous panel spoke at length about this tension here and this problem of decolonization. I return also to Tucking Yang's work about decolonization as a metaphor, the tendency to romanticize and appropriate theories and praxis that are rooted in repatriating land res resources and autonomy to indigenous groups and people. We take, for example, these moves to occupy as a move to unsettle. While occupation as a metaphor can be a discursive way of situating marginalized perspective as taking up physical space, its clear links to the settler project, particularly as a way of reclaiming private property, make it difficult to untangle from the larger project of racial capitalism. Repatriating resources and control requires a disentangling of the individual from the land, the land from the improvement, the improvement from the political economy. I can compare this to occupying housing authority offices for rent strikes that went on to improve the conditions of public housing for all. Privatizing these public spaces has thus shifted the terms by which and spaces in which we occupy. 
when you occupy and privatize, you cede the space to future occupation. This really came out during my studies of resident management corporations, tenant leaders who had mobilized at the margins about the central need to support and fund public housing for low-income residents, a very collective good in project, were suddenly enforcing lease agreements with the neighbors and surveilling household members. Taking on the role as the legitimate housing manager, these leaders later disbanded these corporations to vote for the eventual demolition and dismantling of public housing in Atlanta. Many would end up in one of the mixed finance, mixed income, mixed use, multifamily or single family units that replaced the public multifamily developments. This summer, Philadelphia had another occupation in two very public and prominent sites, the entry to Fairmont Park, the first and largest park in the city, and the area in front of the housing authority. These occupations were explicitly about the failure of these two public entities in creating space for those who were chronically experiencing homelessness while also embodying identities that were not accounted for in these public services. So the public housing agency does not recognize the non-familial household as legitimate and does not service the 16-year-old runaway. Likewise, the public parks expanse of 800 plus acres have no respite for those experiencing homelessness, even in the many corners of wooded areas that go untouched in the middle of the sixth largest US city. Those seeking shelter in the park are subject to disruption and disturbance, maybe even arrest, but far more likely will be subsumed into the mainstream homeless outreach social service system. Nonetheless, after many weeks of occupation, leaders of these two movements, which while new allied and received support from existing radical organizations in the city, reached an agreement with the city to immediately dismantle the encampment structures. The agreement included a number of arrangements that could largely be constructed as a step towards social housing. Vouchers for some, rehabilitated units from the housing authority for others, shelters for still more, and we even got some tiny homes in the mix. The scattered site units would be joined together in a land trust where the conservatives would receive right of first refusal to all city land up for sale. This is what radical planning studios are made of. Yet in this division of the encampment occupants who were evicted to be clear, the state has constructed new categories for the marginalized, sorting some into existing programs and creating new programs of exclusion for others. The end of the social movement, a set of arrangements or policies transforming existing social relations can result in creating new forms of categories and exclusions or new margins. My new work in Philadelphia schools produced an immediate tension that may not be an actually existing tension, but certainly is an ideological one. While urban planners view housing as a necessary and complicated land use, a component of home values for most is directly related to school quality. In the early revival of US cities that we bracketed in the 1970s or so, we see cities as hubs for the young, empty nesters, non-families, and artists. In these hubs, a million of urban amenities that centered authenticity, experiences, and placemaking created a familiar cookie cutter template of the 21st century revitalized city. As cities began attracting more affluent families, public schools also became amenities in some areas, while others became sites of closure and signally often new spaces for new families to create new amenities. A majority black high school was demolished. The university adjacent to it is helping to construct a new elementary school for its growing young faculty, families settling nearby. As schools in marginalized areas are shuttered, longtime families leave and their devalued homes are valorized by newcomers with new amenities the margins return to the center. In doing this work with predominantly black women, single married widowed partners serving as caregivers or not, the ties to the service industry and increasingly the gig economy clearly stand in sharp contrast to what can only be framed as an anti-worker political movement. This movement resulted in the passage of Prop 22 and the destabilization destabilization of attempts to center marginalized service care and professional gig workers priced out of cities. As cities grow into areas of amenity, pleasure, ex excess, and escape, marginalized workers commute from ever distant origins, spend less time and earn less wages at their work destinations, and are receiving the burdens of the state's evolution of employer responsibility and workers' compensation, risk, health, and safety. This anti-worker movement also forecloses one of the central ideas about cities as sites of accumulation, certainly, but also as sites of socioeconomic mobility. Here, the, we see the marginalized are not brought into the fold, but marginalized even more to the point of outright displacement. Finally, a more recent problem emerging in the era of big data, but arguably was here all along. I spoke also about this in the beginning, this 
urgency and planning to speak in its language of power. I often position and provoke my students to translate planning as a language of power, but occasionally we start to teach it, use it, and suddenly it is the only language spoken. So our quest, often my quest, to show a more representative, more complete, more full story using more data points, from photos to stories to surveys, is perhaps too focused maybe on the inputs and processes without thinking about whether we are truly transforming the plans or just accommodating more demarginalized groups with them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rodriguez. Um, next, we have uh, Professor James Spencer. I can turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the prior two, two speakers. Very interesting to see. Um, I'm going to shift gears a bit. Um, and this may be a little bit different, but I, but I, I promise it's going to be in the same vein of the theme of the conference. And, um, and really, because when I got the invite, um, I was excited to kind of, you know, share, share some ideas. Um, but I also took to heart the centering of the theme on war, conflict, and violence that Hiba, and again, like everybody else, thank you for putting this together. It looks like a great um, collection here. Um, but also, also on planning. Um, and, and the planning terminology that's also used in shaping this, this collection of, of speakers and ideas, um, and, and really center on bringing theoretical perspectives to action on a range of issues in and outside of the university, right? And so in, in that sense, um, it's going to be shifting a little bit, but I think, Akira, what you sort of ended with, with sort of the use of data to really understand these kind of tense political dynamics is really the spirit, I think, that, that um, we as planners really um, try to strike that, that, that balance. Um, now, uh, what I'll talk about uh, is three basic things, but kind of who I am, what my motivations for research are, and my research trajectory. Because in order to understand the research trajectory, it's, you have to understand the other two things. Um, and as, a, as an anthropology undergraduate major, I, 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 you know, I can't really do anything conceptual without situating myself within the the framework of, of what I'm sharing, because um, it wouldn't really make sense otherwise, I think. Um, so let me just start off, um, you know, who I am. Uh, some of you, and I, I, there's a number of people that I haven't seen the names in years uh, since I was at UCLA and, and elsewhere. Um, uh, you may or may not know me from the planning field, and, and I, by that I mean the disciplinary planning field. Um, but it, it was sort of later in my kind of professional life that I got involved in planning, um, as an academic discipline. Um, but now I sort of, in retrospect, look at the other prior experiences and jobs that I've had as planning jobs, right? As jobs in which the skills that I, that I developed and, and started teaching and research on um, in planning are really sort of relevant beyond what we conventionally think of as planning. And again, given the spirit of what this, what this collection of, of discussions is, is oriented towards, how do we shape the future of planning? And I, and I think that there's, um, we need to think about what planning is uh, and, and what are the relevant institutions. Um, now, I, I will put the, the, the qualification on everything I will say. While I do think that what I do fits into a post-colonial, um, uh, neo-colonial uh, critical perspective, I would absolutely say that what the subjects that I work on, I would not frame them um, as critical right, or post-colonial or anti-colonial in the subject themselves. It's actually more of the location of the research itself that I see in that frame. And I think that's, it's important to sort of make that distinction because, um, because they both need to work in concert. And pedagogically, I think we need to understand that this, there, there are multiple uh, aspects of post-colonial when we think about planning and the need for, for bringing theory to action or, or um, you know, whatever, however you want to call it. So anyway, all that to say, uh, two, two kind of critical, critical experiences, I think, shape the way that I've approached my research in, in the longer term. Uh, you know, when I finished college, I, I worked in Vietnam. I had a fellowship to uh, live in Vietnam, and, um, and this was 1990 and 1991. Um, and at the time, it was a very sort of rare experience. And um, following on that, I worked for an organization called the um, you know, sort of, uh, it's called the US NGO Forum on Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and more, um, you know, another name was the US Indochina Reconciliation Project, which was kind of an outgrowth of um, an anti-war movement, 
right? So if you think about, um, you know, sort of post-coloniality, the, the initial sort of experiences that brought me to planning were really sort of in the, the, the tail end of the, almost the, the ideal type of an anti-colonial struggle, right? And, and perhaps the most widely recognized, you know, um, struggle that real war and conflict um, struggle against colonies and, and the US included in that. Um, and then, you know, a second experience was um, working at the Ford Foundation where, you know, it is sort of very much of, you know, a button down kind of, you know, capital based um, institution, yet on the other hand, it is very radical in some ways, though it doesn't um, like to, to promote that. Um, and, and I'll come back to a bit of that uh, in the past. So, so those are sort of the, the, the primary kind of experiences that sort of shaped the, the ways that in which I professionally engaged with a, a colonial type of moment in the world um, and, and approach planning, right? And, and the, the perspectives that planning ultimately gave me um, and that I brought with me into my academic career. Um, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, my, speaking of my research trajectory, it all actually started, I, I did a project on the social impact, an anthropology project on the social impact of Agent Orange in post-war Vietnam, right? Now that's not a planning topic, but why not, right? This is, this is something that has to do with land use, it has to do with politics, it has to do with, um, uh, you know, human behavior, both, you know, sort of directed political violence, but also sort of the follow on effects and managing um, development in in marginal areas. And again, sort of the theme of, of marginal areas, we, we tend not to think about those kinds of things as planning topics, but but there's a lot of great skills that can be brought to that. Now, you know, as a young 18 or uh, 21 year old, there's not a whole lot that that I could articulate in a coherent way um, on that subject. But it but but I do think that if I were to go back, it would be a really great subject for planning um, and, and post-war planning. But, but I guess the, the other thing about the, the motivations for research, that, that whole period um, is that, that I was exposed at a moment to a landscape. And, and by that, I mean a physical landscape, which is, which is the link to planning um, and a social and political landscape that in which planning was very much coming to the fore as an activity and this, you know, in, in planning and planning theory, we teach about utopianism. We, we talk about, you know, this moment when, you know, cities became, you know, uh, subjects for study, for designing the future. And in, in a post-colonial struggle, right, you know, after 30 years of, of violent conflict and war, there's a relief when peace comes. And after the five, 10 years of peace, there's a moment when people realize, well, we've got to build things. We have to construct a new society, right? And so I came in in that moment when there was this, where it was this almost utopian vision about what um, what the world can and should look like, and and very explicitly, that would look like a, a post-colonial society. Um, and 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 what I say is that thinking about and 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 Hiba, I think in one of your com correspondences, you you said sort of what is. Um, planning in a future characterized by doom and gloom of you know, pandemics, war and conflict, and, and which I largely agree with. To me, the, the background was at the moment, there, there's a certain moment when planning becomes more important. And, and, and the voice of the planner who's thinking about 20 years ahead becomes more important than in the middle of the struggle, right? And that's, that's at that moment in, you know, so the early, early 90s, I think that, that I just sort of happened to, to, to drop into. Um, and, and I, I will say that there's, uh, you know, you mentioned um, theoretically and academically, you know, it wasn't sort of a one-off thing, I think, because, because I am very interested in, in sort of planning and its relationship to, to uh, decolonization, activism and, and um, history writ large. And, um, you know, th th there's, there are many stories out there that I think planners can engage with from a global scale that goes beyond sort of um, the diversity of global examples and the unity of um, global approaches to capital. And, and I say that, you know, sort of not being, this is not my academic area as a specialty, but it's a context, again, where a lot of the, 
you know, I, you know, as a child of the 60s and, and early 70s, you, you're sort of embedded with a lot of the icons of, of civil rights, anti-war and all these things and just exposed to it at a very young age. And, you know, we, we talk about Ho Chi Minh, we talk about the Black Panthers, we talk about Martin Luther King. All of them are great and, and there's the narrative that we tell each other about them. But we oftentimes forget that MLK was very radical Right, he wasn't nobody. You know, the, the general population was not particularly comfortable with his ideas. Nor do we recognize that uh, the Black Panthers, and this is something on a on a current project that I'm working on. I've you know I've come back to something that I reviewed back in the early '90s. The, the actually the Black Panthers offered to send uh, military troops to the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese government, and the the North Vietnamese Foreign Ministry wrote a very nice letter back to them saying thank you. We'll we, you know we'll we'll draw on your support when we need it. And it was very real, there, there, there was a very global perspective for anti-capitalism, anti-colonial struggle. Now that's, that's to say nothing of the, the origins of Ho Chi Minh himself, who actually he's the, uh, uh, people talk about Viet Q, which is overseas Vietnamese. He's the first overseas Vietnamese because at, at the age of you know, 20 or something, he went to live in France and the United States until he came back to, to kind of continue the revolution. And, and one of the formative, several of the formative experiences that he had were uh, going to colonial Senegal and understanding that, um, that the struggles of the Senegalese people in colonial France were very similar to the things that he faced up and, and grew up with, um, as well as living in New York where he, he would go and listen to um, Malcolm X and, and that shaped a lot of his thinking. And he brought that back to, um, to his work in, in Vietnam that we all hear the story about. Um, so, so there's, there's a larger history of, of decolonization that's out there and th lots of activism that, that I think as planners, we can sort of analyze these things and we can think about them um, from a more kind of, uh, you know, both critical, but also illustrative way. Um, now, I, I will say again, um, coming back to some of the other things beyond sort of my own personal experience, there, there are institutions that were created at that time Right, that I think planners can really sort of learn from and learn about the relationship between theory and practice. And you know, I say that as, as sort of a, a buzzword kind of thing, but, but however we talk about it is sort of the concepts we discuss in, in debates, in um, uh, 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 you know, academic and, and other kinds of formats and the actions that are done. And, and I say this, um, uh, you know, having um, worked at the Ford Foundation where, you know, it's interesting because the, the Ford Foundation was the first place where they funded the meeting, the first meeting between uh, P.T. Bota and um, the African National Congress. And at the same time, they also funded uh, an extensive meeting between the Vietnamese Communist Party and the ANC to discuss the, the value of continued struggle, military struggle. Right, and these are for me. These are planning. These are these are long-term planning investments. Right, they 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 are based on the same kinds of premises of of how do we bring sort of global kind of conceptual um, connections and make them um, through a collaborative process. How do we make them them real and translate them into actions and decisions? Um, Okay, anyway, all that to say that, you know, again, that, that, that in order to understand the kinds of things that I have done academically in, a, in this context, you need to kind of understand that, that background. And I will say that since those experiences and, and having those perspectives generated from my, my experiences, you know, my research trajectory um, has, has been oriented towards, you know, sort of developing sort of the research skills and questions that that fill a gap in those things. It, what I see as filling a gap in those, in those areas. And, and, and admittedly, it's very technocratic, right? Uh, uh, explicitly so, or, or intentionally so. Um, and, uh, you know, so for the first thing, when I, I, I did my degree at, at UCLA, I worked a lot on, you know, urban economic development and really focusing on things like enterprise zones and empowerment zones and the earned income tax credit and, you know, in quantifying the benefits of, of certain things, not, not because I believe that, that these were the absolute truths, but because in order to get the voice out there of a certain perspective in a, in a policy conversation where everything was driven by economics, there's a certain kind of language that one needs to speak, 
right? And and um, in order to kind of get a sort of a certain voice amongst a certain group, and that group I, I always thought as sort of the policy wonks, um, you know, and and that's not the only perspective, but it's a complementary perspective to to other things, um, you know, and also in terms of in terms of teaching, I spent the first um, decade plus at the University of Hawaii, and and again, you know, sort of. People often talk about decolonialization, decolonizing the academy, and and um, you know sort of knowledge systems and all that stuff. And I, I absolutely agree with them. On the other hand, in coming back to the planning aspects, when we're training master students for professional positions, and we want them to have those colonial perspectives in a functional way, in meaning in a way that that helps them rationalize decisions or or process information, you know that the the some of the things that I learned outside of planning in political ecology, um, where we were talking about um, social facts, facts versus social facts, and, and um, you know, some of the work that was done on African um, national parks uh, is, is that, you know, statistics is a social fact. Sorry, can I just interrupt you? We were at time. I'm wondering if you might be able to. Oh, okay. Thank yeah, you. Sorry about that. Um, so, so it's sort of loosening up some of the technical aspects of what we think about in planning. And that to me is sort of the, 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 um, the point of action, right? Within uh, my own research trajectory. Now I will say there's, there's also um, institutionally, we deal with government and we deal with in universities. And in many ways, those are kind of colonial institutions that we also are, are using our research and our perspectives to kind of change. Um, and so I, there's more things I can talk about on that front, um, but I don't want to take up too much time. So thanks. Thank you, Professor Spencer. Appreciate that. Um, may we turn it over now to our final uh, speaker for the panel, Libby Porter. Thanks so much, Delia, and thanks um, everyone for wonderful comments. It's just a real privilege to join you all on this panel um, and uh, looking forward to catching up on all the previous conversations that um, were a bit early in the morning for me to get up for, so I haven't quite managed to hook into them all. Um, it's, a, as I said, a real uh, privilege to be speaking alongside such amazing uh, people. You're, uh, you're awesome um, and I'm humbled. Uh, I want to share a story that will be a really familiar one um, in the sense of its kind of general arc as a story, um, even though it's a, a very local story um, from a region in my part of the world that's now called Western Victoria, but its proper name is Japurung country. And in speaking about this matter, I acknowledge I'm not a Japurung person. Indeed, I am an uninvited white guest living on stolen lands, reaping the benefits of colonization every day in a place that's, whose proper name is Biruranga or Nam, uh, but its loud name is now Melbourne. My respects to Wurundjeri and Bunurong country, uh, to Wurundjeri and Bunurong elders and ancestors on whose unceded sovereign land, my life and that of my family is supported. I'd like to acknowledge Japarung elders, ancestor and country who are currently in yet another fight of their lives. Uh, and also acknowledge that Jabarung elders and sovereign people have asked others, including settler allies, to speak about this story in appropriate ways to help find a, a proper solution. Uh, my respects to and solidarity uh, with all people who are damaged by the violence of colonial capitalism and heteropatriarchy. So this particular story of the violence of colonialism is about a government transport agency and a bunch of transport planners uh, who are wanting to widen a highway uh, so that they can shave a few minutes of driving time, around about two minutes, two to two and a half minutes, they estimate, of driving time off the trip between Melbourne and Adelaide. Now, it, it takes about eight hours to drive between Melbourne and Adelaide. So I, I suspect that two minutes is probably neither here nor there when you've driven that far. But to achieve this widening, around 3,000 trees will have to be ripped out on a small section um, around 12 kilometres of this road uh, in this little part of the world. And hundreds of those trees are highly significant Jabarung law trees, including um, an 800 year old uh, birthing tree. My slides aren't going forward, here we go. Um, 800 year old birthing tree that in the words of the Jabarung sovereign embassy has seen over 50 generations born inside of a hollow in her trunk and also a 350 year old directions tree that's been distinctively shaped to order the landscape and to um, order people's relationships within it. 
So to protect their country, Jaburung people and their allies established back in 2018, a series of sovereign embassy sites and have been on their country doing this work every day, ever since uh, mid 2018. And that campaign has been continuously growing and has gained significant momentum. So this story then is really about the refusal of Jaburung people uh, as the sovereign people and protectors of this place to bow in the face of immense pressure, impoverishment, police raids, racist abuse, never mind just the kind of boring tedium of fighting through courts and land tribunals and media day after day, and to keep fighting in the face of heavy loss and very deep grief. When late last year, in an act of what can only be described as utter bastardry, occurring just days before Melbourne's long 2020 lockdown was coming to an end. Contractors for Major Roads Projects Victoria, accompanied by hundreds of police, cut down the 350-year-old directions tree and carted its body away in a truck. And they then proceeded to break up the camp at the birthing tree, arrest everyone, cordon off the area and assert control. So the centre had returned to the margin. The outpouring of grief and rage at the loss of this tree, this irreplaceable, beloved, critically important tree to Jaburung law and country was profound and Jaburung people continue to fight through the law courts uh, and the courts of public opinion. Now there's much to learn from and with this story of settler colonial ecocidal and genocidal intent. It is of course more than a story. It's the lived reality of Jaburung defenders and the lived reality of country being continuously and permanently damaged. And I thought to share it because it in this context because it rather neatly encapsulates the, the possibility of reconceptualizing planning from the margins, um, this uh, theme of this, this panel. And I want to share a few thoughts on that possibility here, um, but then I want to kind of try and problematize that possibility a, a little along the lines of um, what Teresa was saying before, because I think actually it reveals some of the flaws in our current ways of thinking, or at least in my current ways of thinking about and with the margins. So thinking about this story, there's some obvious kind of margin centre types of relationships. So present are the kind of racialised margins of settler colonial society. Um, there's the geographical margins of a tiny rural locality in Western Victoria at the nether ends of the world that nowhere else, you know, is thinking about. This is, you know, hardly a place from which mainstream planning thinkers would think that the work of planning is being done or planning theory is being done. And how those margins and, and centres are, are, are created and sustained is, of course, important. Uh, but I think they're obvious and well rehearsed and, and I won't unpack them further here. Instead, I want to pay attention to the epistemological and ontological margins and centres at work here, um, or perhaps in um, Theresa's terms, the transversality of those um, ideas. So if we're serious about learning with and from so-called margins, then that would require asking what it would mean to learn with Jabberung laws and knowledge about what might constitute proper planning in this place. And we would see that Jabberung planning knowledge and governance and law and theory has always been here and still remains. And that law governs relationships in an entirely different way. Uh, whereas Combummery scholar Mary Graham teaches the land is the law and you are never alone in that context because you are always knitted into kinship relationships with everything around you. You are intimately connected to country. Um, in the words of Gonpul scholar um, Aileen Morton Robinson, this relationship is embodied. So learning with the philosophies that come from this place, then we'd see that this road cuts the body of country. It cuts through the flesh and veins of country. It severs connections. It upends the normal order of things. It upends the law that's held and holds in flows and connections and relationships. And when that is damaged, there's the potential to damage all of those who need country to survive, which is, of course, all of us, whether we're Jabberung people um, or others, and of course humans and other than humans as well. So learning with the philosophies that come from this place, I'm repeating that deliberately because I think it reveals something rather presumptive about what we take as assumed understanding for thinking about margins and centres. Jabberung law upends the assumption that Jabberung is at the margins. For of course, Jabberung law and knowledge is the centre here, not because it's recognised, by mainstream society. It's not, in that sense, it's fully marginalised. It's the centre because it's here. Jabberung country is here, it remains. Jabberung law remains. Jabberung people remain. The relationship is sustained and is at the centre of the country. Uh, it, it's whiteness that doesn't belong. It's settler colonialism that unsettles an established ancient order. 
settling has always been unsettling, a radical not belonging. Saying this, of course, I don't mean that whiteness is somehow on the margins and uh, not wanting to <laughs> allow uh, whiteness to give claim to being marginalised. Um, I hope that's understood. So perhaps rather than simply asking, how do we learn from the margins? I wonder if we might also need to ask, how is it that a worldview that doesn't belong here, that is marginal in its relevance, connection and relationship, is both violently dominant here and perpetually sustained? What is our role in its perpetuation as planners? If we're serious about learning from the margins, what are we doing about the perpetuation of this centering dominance of things that don't belong? A centering that I think most of us in this field are ourselves material to. These are, we're material to laws and worldviews and knowledge systems that are in their fact marginal. So I think we need to begin um, unpacking that a little bit, of course, with truth and with the root of things um, and thinking about uh, how the tearing out of roots has structured the relationship between planning and Indigenous people, uh, certainly here in, in this colony where I am at the moment, um, since before the ships got here. And learning with the margins, I think, tells us how to look for how that relationship is perpetuated. Uh, and there are many analyses of, uh, that we could draw on here, um, particularly from um, brilliant Indigenous scholarship on the liberal politics of recognition, on the cunning seduction of settler law as a space of inclusion, of the slippery ways that diversity politics co-opts and encloses exactly as um, Akira was, was talking about before. I think these are essential for sharpening our conceptualization of how that which has centered itself perpetually wants to co-opt what it has produced as its margins. Uh, as Tony Birch, uh, fabulous uh, Aboriginal author here in Australia says, uh, here in the colony that is Australia, the dissent is usually seen as benign. Uh, it's the apparently benign space uh, in the planning context where you know, transport planners do their so-called consultation and inclusionary work. Uh, and this is, of course, you know, present in this, in this Jabrung case where um, the transport planners kept saying, but we consulted, uh, we're just following the law, uh, while denying the kind of extant violent politics of a system where white law gets to decide who to consult with and who to ignore. So there's this kind of cultivation of symbolism um, in order to um, silence dissent and alterity, and that's long existed. And I think it goes uh, in its contemporary form to obscure how things continue. So back in 1985, a tangent, but I'll come, I'll join it in a minute. Uh, back in 1985, uh, Audre Lorde spoke generously to an assembled group of white women, um, generously and pointedly, as, as she always does, uh, to a group of white women in Melbourne who were fervent in their desire for difference, hence their invitation to her. And she pointed out that the absence of Wurundjeri and Indigenous women who have always been speaking cannot be heard by their whiteness. Indigenous women are still, in fact, not there, as she says here, uh, back in 1985. They're still not there at the centres that white women insist on creating and taking up here in the colony. During International Women's Day just this week, it was disappointingly predictable to hear of the many instances where Indigenous women were overlooked or dropped from various uh, International Women Day, Women's Day programs, including Strong Warriors, Chelsea Watego, Mariki Onis, Veronica Borri, uh, among others. As Audrey Lord says, out of their mouths come what you have said you most want to hear. The centre desires the margins. It wants to hear from difference, but it what fails to hear, cannot hear. This begs a colossal question, how to think with and practice with the difficult politics of learning with the margins. When the capacity to practice this, for someone like me at least, is a choice sustained by the centre. I am in and of the centre, epistemologically, materially, experientially. So for those of us who are sustained by centres of any kind and yet are engaged with learning with or from the margins, I think we might need to find ways to upend the organisation of margins and centres. It's too easy and too damaging to imagine that thinking with the margins means only creating space and bringing attention to the other stories that could be told or other voices that need to be heard, other ways of theorising planning. While vital, I think it's our responsibility, certainly for someone who inhabits a body like mine, to notice how dominant regimes hold up the very inclination to do so and the capacity to turn our heads the other way when it suits less. So as Dwayne Donald says, if colonialism is an extended process of denying relationships, then decolonization can be not, cannot be disconnected from the practice of relationships with material and lived realities in real places, on real bodies 
and lives every day, including the body of country. And it can't be disconnected from the practice of dismantling the centre. So I guess I'm putting out a, a kind of a, I don't know, warning, I suppose, um, to those of us in planning who are held up by different vectors of privilege to be watchful for when the invocation to learn from the margins needs to be problematised and declared absolutely not enough. To notice when that move toward the margin might feed a kind of cunning move to innocence or be deployed as a convenient stand-in uh, for the very much more terrifying work of confronting and dismantling the systems that sustain those vectors of privilege. If learning from the margins is about creating presence and visibility in a way that serves the interests of an unchangingly white planning field, like, for example, indigenising the planning curriculum, scare quotes intended, uh, which is very much, uh, you know, de rigueur in Australian universities at the moment, this may actively reaffirm racialized ecocidal logics, the same logics that are underway in Jabberung country. Jabberung people are not asking to be engaged with. They know who they are and they know the law they stand in. They're asking to be in a relationship of obligation with, for, with those of us in the centre um, and we're being asked to understand and practice that. And, and I think that in all its flaws and awkwardnesses and imperfections has to be continually practised uh, if it's to be true. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Porter, uh, for those provocations. Um, can I invite the audience to ask your questions in the chat or in the Q&A chat? And I will start to collect those and present them to the panel. And perhaps while we wait for those to come in, I might start off with a question of my own. Um, um, I wonder if I could take up um, something that Libby Porter just said around um, a question for us all. Um, what is our role in perpetuating systems of dominance, um, um, particular worldviews, uh, um, uh, um, kind of logics, practices, and inflection toward a hegemonic understanding of the world? What is our role in dismantling um, that? Perhaps if I could ask the panelists to consider within the realm of planning education. It's a big question. I'll jump in this and, and <laughs> I'll put on my, my other hat as an academic administrator. I think they're very clearly, there is a certain kind of, um, I, I hesitate to say this, but, but, I, but I will because I, I think it's true is that the university is probably, in my mind, the most um, deeply uh, European su supremacist type of organization. And I don't say that in, in, a, in an offhand way, nor even in a purely critical way. But I think if we look at the history of the North American and, and European university, it is, it is explicitly based on a culture imported from, from a European uh, to, to North America from Euro European kind of um, frame, cultural framework. And that's, you know, th that we see these debates about the canon, right? What is, what is the canon in English literature? What is the canon in, um, you know, in history and, and these kinds of things. Now that, that's all kind of big picture, but I also think that when we are in an academy, we, as planners, we need to think about this intersection between theory and practice. And we don't have systems in higher education, in our institutions, that effectively value what needs to be valued to effectively make some headway against that, that sort of colonial history of the institution. And I think particularly in terms of tenure and promotion, we're, we're very rigid, even within planning, about what counts. And, I, and I'll, I'll say one thing, um, you, know, I, you know, I know there's some more interesting work these days being done on film, right? And, and planning and with communities using film and in particularly indigenous communities. I think Canada, I think Leona Sandercock has, has written a lot and, and presented a lot about this. How do we incorporate that into our value system? Not in terms of, of do we like it or not, but do we give credit on equal footing to a published article in something or a book in a, in a, in a university press? That's a challenge, but it's something that we control. Other thoughts? Well, maybe I'll jump in again, Delia. I think, um, James, you, that's a great point. Um, 
and uh, I totally agree. Uh, and I think as well, uh, we might need to think about how to um, expand the range of um, of our language around, you know, in, incorporate and inclusion and, and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I think there's a, uh, I think someone mentioned before in a, in a conversation, I, I can't remember, it was way too early in the morning for me to remember who it was, um, said, uh, you know, there's this, there can be this kind of gesturing to a kind of decolonizing agenda by, through things like citational politics or, or whatever. Now, I think some of those things are incredibly important. Um, and the ways in which we centre certain voices and and you know al allow others to you know you know what I mean the extent to which we're going to cite dead white dudes right is we need to kind of let that go um, and that's terribly important but it isn't enough I think um, and I guess what what I'm saying is um, how are we going to learn with voices that are telling us telling me anyway, is, um, many of them, they're actually not interested in being included in our centre. They have their own domain, uh, their own law system. It's, it's not about, um, can I come into your world? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of conversation. And I think that's a massive challenge for us, particularly in planning education, uh, because uh, it kind of unpicks the nature of what we thought we were doing <laughs> in planning education. I don't pretend to have any answers, but I certainly think we need to create different kinds of spaces within our classrooms uh, and beyond our classrooms um, to enable something different to emerge. I'm sure other panelists have much more um, insightful comments than me on that. So um, I may want to add something. I, I Libby, thank you for, for your presentation for we are just sad. I agree um, entirely with what you said. And I, I definitely think that the practice of citation, for example, although they are very important, they are definitely not enough. And to me, more than practice of citation, we have to change practice of authorship. And, um, and it's pretty hard to, to change there. I think that I talked about a little experiment that we're doing, the four of us in collective authorship, but it's, um, but it's minimal. I think that the main challenges will come from new practice of research. And I think that that's what we have to unsettle. Um, I've always done research in the peripheries and in the poor neighborhoods of cities like Sao Paulo. And I think it's um, what it is to work with those people and incorporate them in the process of research and give them credit, alter with them, it's gonna be like one of the biggest challenges that you have to have is not for us to be sitting here and just talking for them. And that's the, that will be the most difficult thing to, to happen and the one we have to work on. But that's the same thing for the planning process, right? I think that just participatory planning needs lots of, of uh, lots of work. So people, until we get to have real participatory planning processes will be really lots of work, but it's probably where we have to go to. Thank you. Akira, did you want to add anything? Um, one thing that separates me from my students is that they are taking on more debt than I probably ever would uh, for jobs that are disappearing and more precarious. And so to task them sometimes with these um, like massive transformative participatory engaged and overwork and underpaid processes um, is also a challenge and a privilege that we have um, in, the, in the like tower, you know? And so I just think about, you know, like obviously I, I always encourage my students to do all of these things to, um, you know, engage in communities in ways that do transform these relationships and power. Um, but realistically, you know, a lot of their job is modeling or, you know, like paperwork or admin work and they, they don't get to do any engagement. It's like a, it's a non-mandated, non-paid thing here in the US. So it's, you know, it's not going to be done by um, incoming new students who are, you know, $150,000 in debt. 
Um, and so I, I do also think about that as the, um, as higher education becomes more costly, thinking about um, how we are kind of like furthering and deepening these sort of um, privileges and, and marginalizations. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in through the Q&A chat. I'll start with Mohammed Ali Sharif, who writes, it is interesting to see how traditional communities nurtured a healthy relationship and sustainable co coexistence with land and with water, forests, wildlife, and other peoples. The wisdom, philosophies, and practices of these communities is on the margins in contemporary planning practices. This question is, if I can try and find it, the urge to formalize all informalities through a political planning process needs to be resisted. Any thoughts on this? Yes, I have many thoughts on this. I agree entirely. We don't have to necessarily formalize our informalities. Actually, I think that's the whole idea of operating through this transversal logics is that you find ways of um, participation, incorporation, in, and improvement without having to necessarily exclude what is informal or only negotiate with what is legalized. And I think that to, to have this state um, recognize that it uh, plans, like the city of Sao Paulo, the master plan for this, the last master plan for the city of Sao Paulo start by saying that that's a plan for the real city, which means that it's not only a plan for the legal city. And that, that mode, so it, it tries all the time to operate with the, the ideas that we have, that the plan should include everything. It doesn't matter if it's formal, or informal, but you have to have like an environmental plan for the whole city. It doesn't matter like the, the kind of uh, legal formal status of the land, for example. And I think this is a start. It's a way of, um, of operating across all those kind of um, old um, binaries that were all meant to exclude and that we should just, uh, you cannot transform them all, but you can ignore many of them and, um, and operate in other terms. Uh, let me add a, a, a bit of an opinion on this because a lot of the, the subject research that I do in planning is on informal water supply providers and, it, and it, it, my short answer to the question is yes and no, obviously it's unsatisfying, but, but it really is sort of, it's a political choice, right? Does, does the formalization of something support a community? And I'm not saying that we should, you know, tell people to, or tell communities to, to formalize an informal structure, but, but resisting it under all circumstances is kind of a, you know, it's sort of a, an all or nothing question. I think that that communities sometimes they'll decide like we need to formalize this because you know we we like the DeSoto approach of you know getting access to capital. Now that may come along with all sorts of questions of inequality and 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 um, this kind of stuff. But it's not really again for us to say we they should resist it. It's really just a choice about I think the the politics of that community, the the mechanisms by which it becomes formalized. You know, and, and this becomes very apparent when you talk about mapping, right? I mean, especially with indigenous communities is, do we want to actually, you know, sort of formalize our, our knowledge? And it's, it's, uh, it's an open question. I think the best that we can do as academics is, is illustrate the choices and the long-term implications of those choices in an, in an engaged way. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And maybe just to add, um, uh, isn't it interesting how we, we get stuck in this kind of language of, you know, formalizing and, and you know, we're, we're still kind of stuck in that a little bit, even though um, so many people, including people in this call, have, have offered other kinds of um, options for, for language. And I think we, we, we are a bit kind of, our imaginations are a little bit stuck uh, in, in thinking about, is it, is it you're always seeking recognition from the state or, and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, what interests me, I guess, most in that is less, you know, should we or shouldn't we, um, but, and more um, 
kind of what's going on in that process of, of drawing in, uh, because certainly from uh, what I see here in this little corner of the world uh, is when institutions move towards um, that sort of space of recognition. So, you know, there's a huge movement at the moment to, you know, as I said before, indigenize the curriculum, uh, to use indigenous knowledges to manage fire, for example, because we have this huge problems with um, bushfire as uh, in many of the parts of the world that you're all occupying do too. Um, and that's great stuff. Like that's really, really important because these are vitally important knowledge systems. Um, but the moment they come into contact um, with, with, with the state um, and, and indeed I would say with just whiteness generally and, and the kind of settler colonial impulse, it, things start to go terribly awry um, and, and that seems to be almost always the case. So I think what we have to kind of be watchful for and part of our, our, our role, I think, um, in the academic space is to really be looking at that, what is going on there and, and noticing those dynamics and, and processes and, and really drawing them out and illuminating them um, is, is at least a step. Thank you, Libby. And thank you, Mohammed, for the great question. Um, I have another question here from Jennifer Tucker, who writes, uh, thinking of Teresa's work with collective authorship and perhaps Libby's cl collaborations and the, necess the necessity to move against possessive individualism. Are there other collectivities we can center, mobilize and build? And what does this look like? I see this as a question as, as much for Libby and for Teresa as for everyone on the panel. Maybe we should let the others speak first. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll say a little bit of thing again from, a, from the academic management side. You know, these are the structures that we're, we inherit, right? And I, I mentioned some of the, you know, film, right? We, we don't know how to count that very well as, as a scholarship, right? Um, and, and similarly, we don't, we're just barely in tenure and promotion processes, getting to you know accepting co-authorship as legitimate amongst academics, right? I mean, oftentimes you know I read all the time this person has not published enough individually, right? So that's a that's a structure that we create now. Let alone working with the community. I think Teresa, you mentioned how do you how do you involve communities and co-authoring with with them and valuing sort of their input in a formal way. And, and I don't mean this in the, in the planning, credit, but in sort of the, 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 the giving credit, I think that's a long way out from what our current standards are. But I, but I also think it relates to one of the other questions that were out there. Um, I think Maria uh, Castillo was saying, what would happen in academia if community engagement were a defining element of tenure? It has to do with what we think, what we value as scholars, right? But part of the problem is that we haven't defined what does it mean community engagement, right? How do we know good in community engagement that we should count very well in, in promoting somebody professionally? And how much of it, you know, what is it, you know, sort of like they showed up at a meeting and then wrote 20, 20 pages about it and, and, um, and are counting that as community engagement, which wouldn't necessarily be sort of something that, that has the same value. That's a lot of work to do, but I think it's, we need to do that if we want to decolonize the mechanisms for promotion and, and um, institutionalizing kind of power relationships within a university. Um, Jennifer, I just want to say, <clears throat> I just said something about collective, uh, incorporating people we are researching with into the production of knowledge. I think there are lots of things we can say, um, but, um, we can incorporate, we can think of the classroom and, and the exchanges that happen in classroom in much different terms than what you usually think, like the professor and the students who listen. So those are the spaces that can be transformed in spaces of co-production of knowledge, depending on how you design them and how you conceive of them. But I think that basically the way you put your question what are the other collectivities we can center, mobilize and build? I think this is basically our political work. It's just like the work of the, of the political communities we decided to be part of 
and we want to engage with. It's, uh, it goes well beyond uh, the, the university. And I particularly think that we cannot separate as our, our work as intellectuals at university from our political work. Um, I come from a tradition in Latin America in which intellectuals are primarily public intellectuals. So there are, they are in the public sphere debating and, uh, and engaging in politics all the time. And I think that if we can change towards that tradition, that would be really uh, a great step. Thank you, Teresa. Anything else, others wanna add thoughts? this particular question? Oh, Akira, please. Um, yeah, I'll just say that I've attempted to do some collective works, um, but I the difficulty often comes with like, James and others have alluded like this like 10 year attention that like I we're not on the same timelines for like, first of all, I can take four years to write an article and everyone's okay with it. But like usually it's people that I'm working with want something out immediately. Um, so we have this one group of educators we've been working with and documenting their experiences over the last year of teaching um, public and private youth. And they, we've, we've kind of like just stolen like the op-ed project and just like given it to them as like a way of saying like, this is a way of taking these discussions and articulating them in a way that gets your perspective out. Um, and we landed an op-ed. One of our educators got an op-ed in the in the local paper, and that's like wonderful. Um, but it was a it it's hard again because I feel very much like shaping that voice, right? Like, oh, this is how you have to write an op-ed. You have to provide these countering points of views, and you have to say there's a transition, a, a pitch, and a lead, and all. There's like a whole format that is not really going to capture the types of knowledge that I think we're trying to convey. Um, and so there's still like this, like the formalization of the informal, like we said, and I don't even consider this informal knowledge. This is just undocumented knowledge basically. And so it was, um, and so yeah, I, I, I am down for other collectivities that actually take us out of the picture entirely, um, but I still feel like they can result in kind of the the same things because of those limits to the imagination. Thank you, Akira. Um, I just jump in as well. Yes, please. Yeah. Great. That's such a great point. Um, and I, I think as well the uh, um, this is a question that came to me from um, Oren in the in a in the chat in in the private chat to the panelists. Um, and uh, he's reminded me, of course, of the importance of building coalitions. You know, beyond silos of particular interest groups or whatever that might be and I know um, all of us have spoken about those things and I'm sure all of the uh, conversations across the, this wonderful conference have been talking about that but you know linking those things together because the, the the question of you know patriarchy is not separate from the question of settler colonialism and the question of, of capitalism is not separate from heteropatriarchy that these are all interlinked so you know the question of intersectionality and I, and I think finding spaces where um, and they do exist uh, certainly here in in my context uh, where uh, people are coming together and finding those connections and speaking from the intersection uh, is really powerful uh, and and you know, the work that we could do, our political work to um, amplify or create space or, you know, put our bodies next to or whatever it might be, those kinds of intersections and, and, and collaborations and coalitions is super important. Thank you for that, Livy. I have a question here from Taisha Redden, who um, writes, um, in 2018, the ACSP Committee on Diversity presented evidence that the American planning profession was getting wider and that it was a handful of schools, mostly in Texas, responsible for the bulk of non-white planners. How do you think this phenomenon affects decolonization of planning training and curriculum? I mean, certainly it makes it harder to make it a problem <laughs> um, that this is a, something we need to be doing and an effort we need to be working towards. Um, I, I get, 
I'm like, oh, how do we write all those diversity statements and the field's getting wider? But I know how it works. I think it's related to my earlier point about cost. <laughs> but I do think that um, certainly they're related. Um, and I do wonder how long this moment's going to last, um, if it will just kind of be the year of it, like it was last year, kind of the, the year of George Floyd's statements, right? If this is just something we check and move on, um, or if this is like an ongoing series of conversations. Um, but yeah, great question, Ty. Uh, let me also jump in, because I, I would say we're at an inflection point on this. I think the question is absolutely spot on in terms of what I've seen from the programs I know. Um, and it's not just that they're becoming more white, they're just, they're, they're becoming smaller. Um, and the, the, the planning profession as a field is, is not a particularly lucrative job. So it doesn't kind of get all sorts of people coming from, from all walks of life. And it's, it's part of a larger kind of challenge. Now with that doom and gloom situation, and you can go to ACSP and the administrators conferences and all this kind of stuff and hear more doom and gloom about that. So I won't go into that, but, but what I will say is I think planning is at an inflection point at the moment, given the way the field is, field is organized at the intersection of, again, what I, what I say as sort of large big picture thinking, anti-colonial critical theory and technocratic empiricism. And, and I say that because right now, you, you mentioned Akira that there's a moment, right? So this year has been very hard, right? It's, it's, it's if we think of our, our, our global and national and, and local communities, that there's been an unprecedented organizing of universally around issues like the murder of, of George Floyd. You know, to a lesser extent, the pandemic, you know, issues around public health, but, but there's a moment right now when there's great attention put on things and again, thinking the long term, the planners, they are not just criticizing or critiquing things. They are critiquing with the purpose of constructing, right? That's why that's what makes the planner different from, you know, sort of the pure critical theorist, right? Now there are urbanists who are pure critical theorists, but the planning aspect is to create something out of the criticism. And that's where I think, given that we have a positivist, a very strong positivist theme within our pedagogy, while at the same time, developing critical perspectives, it's, it's incumbent upon our field to sort of, you know, sort of build up the field that Taisha was, was describing as, as kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of going down a, down a bad path um, to fill that gap. Because I don't think anybody else is going to fill it. There, there's a couple of other fields that, that have that kind of mix of, of professionals within the academy, but, I, but it's rare. Thank you, James. I'd like to just elevate um, a comment that Mia Whiteman um, added to the chat um, that I think helps tease out a little bit more of what Taisha was mentioning in her question. And Mia writes, um, it seems that a key challenge is that quote unquote mainstream planning educators haven't yet come to a place in which they can speak organically and easily about the mutually reinforcing histories of white supremacy, racial capitalism, colonization, and patriarchy, and how these structures influence our planning imaginaries. Whiteness, including the fetishization of the individual, of neutrality, et cetera, continues to be an ongoing challenge, one where some colleagues misconstrue whiteness to mean white people, and it can be pretty challenging. Just to elevate that as a, another dimension of the, of the, of the larger question. So, so well put. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mia, for, uh, and, and for, the, for the original question as well. Uh, I, I mean, I think I can't speak for ACSP because it, it, I don't know it that well, but my observation um, if, as, a, and as an outsider from a kind of margin, I suppose, um, is, is exactly that and that the conversation is becoming harder uh, and in fact, um, Ananya Roy wrote uh, a wonderful piece just we recently published in, in um, Planning Theory and Practice, uh, an interface bringing together voices around silencing um, and talked about not some, a little bit about ACSP, but about other kind of planning institutions, academic planning institutions that are actively involved in silencing. So I think we, you know, this is absolutely a trend and a phenomenon that is present um, and, and we need to be very aware of it. But I think this point of um, the misunderstanding that is a misunderstanding that's kind of embedded in white bodies, that that whiteness is about white bodies and not being able to see how that's true and not true at the same time. Like that we, that our 
our privilege to walk around in the world um, in, in our whiteness is held up by, by racial capitalism uh, and, and settler colonialism, but that we're also, can, we can be involved in dismantling those structures without having to actually dismantle our own bodies. <laughs> I think that this is possible, but we, we just don't have a, um, a, a sensible language and a, we don't have maturity um, intellectually and conceptually in this conversation. I, I, I say, say we, but there's people who, who look a bit more like me, um, because I think that exists, that maturity exists out there but it's kind of operating in another space and, and we're not working with it. So that idea of learning with that material so that we can you know, be better versions of our white selves would, might be helpful. Thank you, Libby. Um, I wonder if we, in the last five minutes that we have, we might turn back to the question of the margins that we started with. Um, we, we, st we started by disrupting the, um, the kind of fixedness of that binary margin center. And um, I'm going to turn to a question by Oren Yiftahil, um, uh, which he puts to Teresa, but I think perhaps could be opened up for the entire panel. Um, he, he says, beyond transversality and complexity, do you find power relations in the production of the city that are per persistent over time? Um, clear hierarchies, for example, would this call for a more structural and stable understanding of the margins? Just answer to him, so maybe I read my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so what I say is that, of course, there are power relations reproduced in the production of the city. And this production, as, as I mentioned, also means the reproduction of incredible inequalities. The, but I don't think we can understand uh, these inequalities and these reproductions of power relations only in terms of margins and hierarchies, because they are reproduced transversely and should be countered transversely, which to me means through the formation of intersectional coalitions, for example. The, because those, um, those in balances of power and those inequalities, they are they come from various parts. They they combine to each other, and they are not necessarily from the margins. And I think that uh, we have to understand that sometimes those coalitions, like you can imagine, like look at Argentina, Buenos Aires, where the biggest coalition they have at this moment is of women of all classes, of all groups, and that is a transversal that has completely shaken the, the political system. So I think that, um, and how you form these coalitions, how do you form those alliances as are conjunctural. You should work for, on them, but doesn't mean that they will come necessarily from what is pre-established as some, uh, some kind of margin. Well, perhaps that's a fitting place to end. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for their provocations and for deepening our understanding of the experience, the knowledge production at, between, with uh, marginal places and positions. <laughs> and um, and um, to uh, remind everyone, all the audience, uh, everyone who's with us today, um, that we will reconvene at five o'clock in about 15 minutes for the fourth and last panel of the day. Um, one that will look at frontiers and their politics of planning, um, moderated by Kian Go, uh, who is assistant professor of planning at UCLA. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.